Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me for the 1% Edge webcast today. This is the fourth in my series of the 1% Edge. We started off talking about the process that you go through to create a 1% Edge for your business. Then we applied that process to leadership. We've applied it to customer service. And today we're going to be applying it to your product or service. And I want this to be as interactive as it can be. So you are welcome to jump in at any time and ask questions during today's program. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Brad right now and he's gonna to explain to you exactly how you can do that. Thank you, Susan, and, and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, like Susan said, we want this to be really interactive for you. So you all have control of your microphones. Um, so whenever you wanna ask a question, just click that microphone icon on the bottom left. Uh, we ask you to just please be mindful of that microphone though when you're not speaking. Try to make sure it's on mute. Um, otherwise, I'm your backup and I'll mute it for you. Um, and if you want to use the chat to type your question in, just simply click that chat icon also in your toolbar and we will uh, relay those questions to Susan. Susan, I will pass it back to you. Great. Thanks very much, Brad. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to say thanks to our sponsors. I would like to thank the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. If you're not familiar with them, it's sbecouncil.org. They're a nonpartisan advocacy group that's advocating for small and medium-sized businesses in Washington, D.C. You really should get to know them and keep up with what's going on in our government. Also want to thank American Management Association and Amacom, my publisher. And of course, thanks to all of you again for joining me. Well, today's a really special webcast because I've been doing these things myself and just talking, 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 talking. Well, I talked to my good friend. I'm so impressed with him. I'm so thrilled to have him. Chris Brogan is joining me today. He is always on the leading edge, believe me. His blogs, his emails that I get are so thought provoking. He is the CEO and owner of Owner Media. He also provides strategy and skills for modern businesses. He's a sought after public speaker. He's a New York Times bestselling author of nine books and he's working on his 10th. I'm just working on my fifth. This guy makes me look like a piker. Anyway, Chris, thanks for joining me. Susan, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you here. So I want to start off because when I talk about creating a product edge or a service edge, you know, I talk to people, it's not really necessarily disruptive technology that really makes a difference. Um, I talk about it in terms of creating just a noticeable difference, just giving people that extra value that they can't get somewhere else. And I read one of your newsletters recently or your emails, and you use the terminology, the same is lame. I love that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? There's a lot of time in our business experiences where we kind of fall into this also ran mode. We say, I'm going to be just like these people, only with a different color or something. And that's really going to cause a lot of calamity. And we're seeing it a lot more often and a lot more rapidly in business today. Uh, for instance, the food uh, restaurant chain, Ruby Tuesday, just went out of business. Well, what was Ruby Tuesday? It was basically Fridays on a different day. No one's going, whoa, I feel terrible. Now what am I going to do to eat? You know, it's not changing anyone's life that it's there or not. If your product or service is basically the is Pepsi okay of your industry, then you're doomed. And I think that there's a bunch of different ways and factors. I'm sure that's, you know, what your book covers in a lot of ways, but there's a lot of ways and factors to get at it. But first and foremost, if you, know, if you have to admit that you're a me too product, start there. Like, cause, cause maybe that's not the best way you can serve the people you're hoping to serve. Well, just like you said, the same is lame. And actually I, I, I put this quote in my book. It's from John Paul Getty, but he says, the man who comes up with a means of doing or producing almost anything better, faster, or more economically has his future and his fortune at his fingertips. And one of the things that I talk about in the 1% edge process is to step away from your business and you have to really reflect on it. You have to look at what's going around. What are the market trends? What is that upstart competitor that could Uberize your industry? What legislation is out there? You know, what things are changing? Even the demographics today are changing so dramatically. You know, baby boomers aren't the, minor aren't the majority anymore. Millennials are. So, Chris, what recommendations would you have for business owners and business leaders to really analyze and say, okay, this is what we need to be doing next and to stay just on that cusp, on that edge. It's really important to keep tracking what your customer really wants versus what you're trying to sell them. This is where every single organization falls into a, a 
problem. And so, for instance, Nestle said they're going to invest billions in plant-based food source eating because plant-based is suddenly a thing for a lot of people. And there's people who choose to do it for uh, their spiritual reasons. There's people who have um, agendas against how they want to protect animals. There's people who think it's just an environmental change that you know takes less room to grow plants than it does to do anything else. So that comes along. The people who make the Yeti Rambler, Beautiful Thermos, uh, are a great company who crushed Coleman because Coleman made something so boring that it was finally in the back corner of Walmart as kind of an oh, by the way. And meanwhile, we both know that the hot stuff stays hot and cold stuff stays cold. There's, there's always that piece. John Paul Getty's not wrong. I would sort of update it for the 21st century to say there are some other metrics we're looking for there. Um, to your point about millennials, well, millennials aren't going to restaurants anymore. I swear I eat food. I'm not hungry, but a lot of my examples seem to be food related. <laughs> Campbell's bought one of those home delivery food services like Blue Apron. I forget what the one they bought was called. Campbell's bought it not because they think, gee whiz, we all want to make our food at home, but because millennials aren't even going to the stores anymore. And they wanted it as almost like a marketing tool to say, come yeah. figure us out. This is what else we offer. Campbell's has a new line called Yes, which is far more healthy stuff. Because the argument used to be, well, you know, we, we've tried and no one wanted it. And it turns out that's not really true anymore. So as you're looking for the metrics in your organization for how you're going to interact and interplay with these needs, what does your buyer most want? And I would look at these kinds of metrics that I have, you know, that I put forward to people a lot, like velocity. Can I get there faster with you? Mm -hmm. Friction. Do you in some way remove friction from some experience that I've, I've tried in the past that I just, it was just so annoying. Connectedness. Can I, if I use your product, do I feel connected to other users of it? You and I both like Yeti. Yes, um, right. uh, the other two are personalization or experience. And so is it something where you have an edge because you can make it feel much more personal when I show up there or experience? How does Disney thrive in a world where less and less people seem to want to go out to big giant amusement parks? Uh, well, they've had a problem for a really long time getting from girl who likes princess stuff <laughs> to teenager who wants to wear black lipstick and says, mom and dad, you don't understand me anymore. They can't find the money in that other demographic. So they bought Marvel Comics. They bought um, the Star Wars franchise. They bought all of these things that kids who don't want to identify with Mickey and Minnie like. So... These are all big company examples, but a super small and solo businesses can still follow the same example because again, it's chasing one certain thing. Well, you know, I, and I know you've done some consulting with Disney. Um, so what Walt Disney said, you can't just focus on selling to the kids, that the adults are really just kids at heart. So, you know, when you're looking at your demographics, especially as we're talking about the change in that right now, some of these older brands are trying to reinvent themselves instead of being grandpa or grandma's or that was my mother's Tupperware party. I mean, how can you reinvent yourself to stay relevant to this moving marketplace? I, I think one of the themes that I see out there for this is that a lot of times we are under the assumption that we're supposed to preserve security as opposed to improve capabilities. And I think that that's a real fork in the road kind of way to look at things. Polaroid failed because they, they failed to recognize how people were very interested in digital. Kodak failed because Kodak, Kodak had the first digital cameras. They never sold any. They thought they would eat into their film business. We have to preserve, we have to be secure. There is no safety in security. Yeah. It's almost always the worst business choice. Um, and, and I'll go back to Disney, for example. Uh, when I went to see a tour of the way they had revamped the park, one of the things they said was, speaking of Kodak moments, that was a big revenue source for them at Disney. You know, the mm -hmm. pro photographer would show up, take a picture of you in front of the castle. And you know what? Turns out in a world where everyone's phone is a, is a camera, you don't need that service anymore. And they were like, what are we going to do? And it wasn't just revenue. They weren't like, you know, we, we need a lot of money. They want memories to leave that park and go other places and all that. Right. They reskinned all of Cinderella's castle to make it a very multimedia video friendly project onto it kind of a thing. So that now the big mouse has all those people with the Kodak moments to put your kids and family up on that giant castle. And the only thing we love more than anything in the world is ourselves. And we want to see us. And that, hey, there I am on the mouse, uh, brought people back to that idea that they wanted that moment. But look at how different that was. So I think that, you know, to, to, to recapsulize that security is the enemy and capabilities are the way to win. 
So I want to go to back to that to Kodak because that's a teaching moment that I like about Kodak is because you and you've talked about this. You've got to know what your market's really buying, what they want from you. Um, Kodak, when they failed to get into the digital uh, industry, you know what they didn't realize. They thought they were selling camera equipment and film and all that kind of stuff. They were selling memories. Right. That's what, it's storytelling. So. How do you tap into what it is you're really selling? Because it's not what you think it is. Well, and I, it's funny. I just made this answer the other day, uh, and I always wreck the quote, but Henry Ford said, if you asked the customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Yeah, right? right. This goes with that because it's not just listen to what your customers want. It's, it's get out in front of the customer. Try to figure out, well, if in a world where this is happening, then what? In a right. world where uh, people are buying fewer cars, in a world where Uber, Lyft, and several other platforms exist to move bodies between places, what will Ford do? What will Chevy do? All those kinds of things. And Ford's answer is, we're going to make much better technology so that it's really just a rolling technology platform, and you're going to really like that. Yeah, right. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But there's, there's all these other uh, solutions to any problem. It's not just go after what the customer says they want because they're almost always wrong. Uh, it's it's presage based on this, this, and this happening. There's going to be double as many senior citizens by 2050 as there are right now. So even though boomers aren't the group, as Gen X becomes the yeah. old, which of which I am, <laughs> as I'm heading towards eventually being a senior, I guess, what's it going to mean that there's double the amount of seniors? What, what's, yeah. what's happening? Healthcare, is, this has happened. And then where does your product or service fit in? People get a lot lost in that moment. But I would say that you know, there's always ways to start thinking it through. If people aren't going to go to destinations to buy anymore, what do I need to do to get seen online? What do I need to do to have Alexa or any of those other home-based speaker-based ordering platforms pick me in the big C? So that's what I look for. So uh, smaller companies and medium-sized companies, um, it's, they can be more agile than the big companies. And I take a look at what happened to Procter & Gamble. You know, Dollar Shave Company came blew them away. They didn't even see that coming. And now they're trying to catch up. And now they're in, um, I forget what city it is, but you can get your pods, your, your Tide pods delivered right to you, or they'll pick up your, do your laundry. Um, do, are we, you think we're going to see more of that, that businesses are going to go direct to the buyers instead of the old distribution models? Absolutely. And, and I was thinking about it today. I was thinking about the fact that the only restaurants that seem to be, and again, I don't know why I'm focusing on restaurants so much, but uh, the only restaurants that seem to be- I haven't kinda, had lunch, by the way. So. <laughs> I just ate. Um, where they're uh, holding their own are these sort of smaller concept type restaurants. Shake Shack is doing very well yeah. selling just two or three types of hamburgers, some shakes, some fries, have a nice day. Um, the people who are having trouble are those kind of all things to everyone's kind of restaurants. And in general, restaurant traffic is down. So if you're a really small company, let's say you sell, uh, I'm looking over out the window here and I'm going to say that you sell, mm, let's go with firewood. I see some okay. firewood out there. So someone sells firewood and, and home heating, but I'm a really small company. I've got like three trucks. I'm in a small part of Northern New England somewhere. And that's what I do. I'm going to have to start thinking, well, what does my customer want that I don't have? They don't want to get me on the phone anymore. So if right. all I get is the phone number on the side of the truck, I got a problem. Oh, I'll go with, let's go back to food, pizza delivery. Little tiny pizza place in my town um, is our last resort because my son can order on pizzahut.com and he can customize every single piece and facet of that pizza. His pizza is unique to him alone. It's a uh, thin crust. It is pretzel crust. It is barbecue sauce instead of tomato sauce. It's like 5,000 types of meat. He's going to die. Wow. Um, and then some cheese. But you can't do that across the street without like a 10-minute phone conversation with someone who hates their life. Yes, right? that's right. Well, the only technology in that whole thing is a website that allows you to click, you know, kind of choose your own adventure style. If the smallest business in the world can make it easier to reach mm -hmm. somebody, the smallest business in the world can say, would it be better if I delivered this in some way? Like that alone. Delivery of some kind. We're pushing, UPS is pushing drone delivery. They're talking now, I heard it in a TED talk, of rolling a UPS truck into a rural area, the lid of it pops open and a bunch of drones spit out and start delivering stuff in all directions. And, and that almost sounds like Alfred Hitchcock in a way, you know? <laughs> sounds crazy, but yeah. not only can we do it today, 
but we will do it today because it saves a great amount of money for UPS and it makes it cost right. effective for people to deliver. And people like in, in a world where everything's getting delivered, UPS, the USPS and FedEx and all those guys are still fighting over who can we serve best. And even they are struggling with this because right. they're trying to serve our really small businesses that don't know how to package things the right way, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and we all want immediate gratification. We 100%. want it right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I ordered I ordered a travel microphone because in this conversation right now on my laptop, I said, you know, I could make my sound better if I just had a new mic. I ordered it while we were talking. Oh my gosh, how funny. <laughs> Multitasking at its greatest. <laughs> Terrible guy, I know. Oh goodness. Um let's let me go back though. Um we're talking about food, right? So, you know, you think about peanut butter and jelly, right? Sure. Um, two different products, two very different things. And somebody had the idea to smear the peanut butter and the jelly on a piece of white bread. And now I think the statistic says the average uh, American eats like 1,400 P&J P &J sandwiches before they get through high school. Um, and then Smuckers came out with the Uncrustables and now all the gourmet people have their own versions of peanut butter and jelly. But the reason I'm bringing that up is I'm saying sometimes the collaboration between two products can make a bigger market for your business. Uh, what are you seeing? What trends are you seeing out there? I'm seeing a lot of that where there's some sort of an economy of scale opportunity where one organization and another organization have the same customer for two different needs. They're not in any way conflicting and they can be friends. Uh, I was actually thinking about that. This is the sentence I started like, I don't know, five minutes ago and never bothered to finish. <laughs> but I was just thinking of some of the dumber franchises and by dumber, it, it, they just haven't seemed to change a lot. And I was thinking, I wonder if, you know, who eats KFC anymore? Kind of nobody in my in my head. Maybe they are, and if they're a sponsor, I feel bad. But whatever. No. I don't think anyone rushes to KFC. I know that people come to Taco Bell uh, because the gamers love it. It's a fast hand eaten kind of fast right, food. Right. But Do uh, Domino's and Pizza Hut deliver. So wh why doesn't one of those guys buy KFC or Taco Bell, or why doesn't KFC or Taco Bell buy them? Because again, the the distribution part of that, the layer of distribution is the challenge. And that's right. where we start looking at our even super smallest businesses. The questions are there. Like, do I accept other payment types besides cash and credit cards? If I'm the kind of person who's willing to try cryptocurrency, is Bitcoin something I want to accept? What are the benefits or negatives to that? Uh, I just saw a thing where Venmo is now, one, PayPal bought Venmo. It's another, it's a peer-to-peer -peer distribution platform for money so you and i go out to dinner you say oh by the way we were supposed to go dutch oh crap right here's 40 bucks yeah. um i can never imagine that really happening but let's pretend and then the this does this new platform is now open to millions of businesses and millions of online so the kinds of people who hey you owe me 40 bucks well great i'm going to use it to pay for a dvd i wanted to get at this store Really? So wow. it's another payment platform. So these are the things people have to start looking at because again, not because they need to be super high tech, it's reducing friction. Is it easier sure. for me to just take my Venmo money, which is fake money in my head and right. use it to buy something? If yes, then I might capture more of your dollars that I didn't have before. Yeah, that's interesting. And you know, that's kind of in a way like the old barter system. You know, right. if we bartered, but I didn't really need your service, but, you know, then I could use that to get something else, you know, down the road, those barter exchanges. Um, now, Chris, one of your books that I really, really like, you wrote, which is called Freak Shall Inherit the Earth. <laughs> I love that title. Um, but uh, Sam Walton, Walton once said that um, if everybody's going in one direction, you know, turn around and go in the other direction. And one of my favorite examples for a business that's doing that, you may have seen it on already, it's called Dirty Rotten Flowers. Have you seen that? No. Oh, it is a riot. It is actually dead, rotten flowers that you can order arrangement. So people send them like to their boss that they hate because they got fired, you know, as a Dear John kind of a thing. I mean, it is hilarious, some of the testimonials on there. But who would have ever thought to take a bunch of, I grew up in a funeral home. I had dead flowers all over the place. Oh my who God. knew I could be making money off of that? Um, but so what are your thoughts about taking that kind of abrupt uh, turn and doing something completely opposite from what everybody else is doing? One of the biggest changes the internet brought us was that there's a market for everything, literally everything. If you, I mean, there are these things that we feel are like sort of new phenomena, but that's only because we've just now seen them. There are these things like people who are called furries who like to dress up in fur costumes and do things with each other. I don't get it. It's not my storyline, <laughs> but I say it to say, 
speaking of the freaks shall inherit the earth. I had a friend, this guy was a, in a band way back in the 80s, um, and it was a heavy metal band, and he was super, super tall and uh, mighty looking. And speaking of the funeral homes, he made custom hand-built coffins for the kinds of people who went to heavy metal and goth shows oh, who wow. would spend three to 5,000 bucks on a really cool looking, put it in the living room coffin for their decor. Oh my goodness. So there's That's a market a for market. everything. Yeah. And I, I was listening to a TED talk yesterday. This, this guy who was, he became an entrepreneur at 64. He just got let go from a company. He had all kinds of manufacturing and packaging experience. And, and he said, you know, I'm really sick of this like one use plastic packaging that's taken over the targets of the world and all that. I want to make stuff out of garbage. I want to make packaging out of garbage that you would willingly and want to put around your package. And he has, and he's doubled his revenue every single year since he started the company. Oh my goodness. And fairly recently. So, I mean, he's doubled twice or three times now and there's no ceiling to it. And it's because there's junk laying around and he figured out a way to make something out of the junk. There's a billion great ideas like that. I, re I read in, remember magazines? I read in Business 2.0 magazine. I'm, I'm joking, by the way. Yeah. I, still, <laughs> I still subscribe to a lot of... <laughs> I, I have a whole stack on my floor over here. So, <laughs> uh, Business 2.0 had a story that was about eBay back in the whale days. And this guy was sat at a bar and he's sitting next to this couple and he says, oh, I'm miserable. I have a whole bunch of floor mats for, uh, what was that Ford car? The Grand Marquis. Oh, and, yeah. And they said, I have like a million floor mats, literally one million floor mats. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm getting killed in warehouse costs. The guy says, I'll sell them. He goes, great. I'll give them to you a dollar a piece. He goes, okay, fine. Yeah. He sold, he sold them for anywhere from 15. And because it was eBay, there was yeah. sometimes people bidding, even sure though you could just buy one. From 15 to $90 a piece. He made oh 13 goodness. million something dollars or something off 1 million floor mats. And then of course you run out of product. So he's like, I'm looking for the next thing. So I'm going to do replacement side mirrors. Wow. Amazing. Right. By the way, Dollar Shave Club was a marketing story around a warehouse full of extra razor parts. That's exactly what made Dollar Shave Club happen. Yeah. There's, you know, there are so many, as my mother always used to say, there's so many ways to skin a cat, right? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, um, one of the things, though, I think about this world that we're living in right now is, you know, trying to stay relevant and looking at your product or service. But, you know, you, you've said you got to look at what the market's wanting, what's, you know, what's out there. Steve Jobs said something like, you can't really ask because, you know, you have to show them. Um, but how do we, in this environment, um, you know, use data, use social media, use ways to really listen and to understand what that little pain point is in the marketplace. One of my favorite ways to handle trend scenarios is to actually just follow the people that do the research for you. Uh, people who are really into certain areas and certain trends are going to go mm -hmm. farther and deeper than you're ever going to go. So uh, there's a, there's a law out there that I used in trust agents. It's Robin, somebody's law. I can't remember the name. It's 150 people. You can have only 150 people in your social circle. That's the whole edge of it period. No human can do otherwise. Um, you may or may not follow that many more people on Twitter or anything, but you really only really talk to 150 people. So our storyline in trust agents is what if you made those 150 people, the kind of people that had a great 150 people. And so you spent your time kind of connecting super connectors basically. Yeah. So one way to keep up on trends is to follow people who keep up on trends. Um, that's one that's part of my job. My job is to go out there and find what might be the next thing to do. Another way is, is to just keep asking your questions. What would happen if, and where, where's my part in this if, and even if the answer is destroy the business, Steve jobs destroyed Apple multiple times on the way. He basically said, this is going to replace our biggest business. And everyone's like, Oh, but show yeah. You know, we live, we have to have laptops, mostly as our creative types and all that, but there's so much more that's being done on phone and tablet that ever was before. And it's right. a lot of people's first device now. All the kids, that's their first device. They're not starting on a desktop or laptop. No. So he was right far yeah. and away. So we have to look for that. What replaces us? What, where are they going to go where we're not? I'm looking down at a gym. This is one of those like $20 a month kind of gyms. And Everyone said, oh, that's it. You know, you would never want to run a gym. And then CrossFit said, well, we'll do $100 a month. 
and it's going to be harder and you're going to hate it. And by the way, a huge in injury uh, rate in this gym. Yeah. Yeah. And people loved it. So, you know, there's yeah. always a zag to the zig, just like you said earlier, you know, if everyone's going this way, there might be a that way that's better. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. Um, oh, I, I just, you, you made me think of something and now I've forgotten what I wanted to ask you. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. um, you know, speaking though of the, the, the CrossFit and all of that, everybody's trying to pick their corner of the marketplace. And I was actually looking at buying franchise myself, a Crunch Fitness. Mm -hmm. and I'm on the phone with the guy and I said to him, I said, well, so tell me how you differ differentiate yourself from any of Planet Hollywood, any of these other places. And he started saying, oh, well, you know, giving me the marketing spin, right? And I said, well, who's your ideal audience? He said, oh, everybody. We have everybody from 20 year olds to 80 year olds. And I thought, being a marketer person myself, no, you're not everybody to everybody. You know, you're not everything to everybody. So how do you begin as you're building your product or service edge to define that market? So I'm very uh, opposed to the concept of a niche because I think that we tend to, when we try to dimensionalize people in the ways that we currently do niche marketing type stuff, I think that it leaves a lot to be desired. I am so different than people my age. I like video games. I am very current and active in very modern video games. I don't play Miss Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> You know, I go to weird movies. I, the things that I like are so nothing like a typical 47-year-old male should be into. And that's me. Um, I think that instead of, of looking at that, what we need to look at is what kind of person, I'm the kind of person who is a better kind of question to ask. Because, yeah. you know, let's, let's take crunch away. But let's say you still want to buy a fitness place. Who mm -hmm. would you want? You know, you might want people who are anywhere from their mid-30s up to their 70s or 80s who want to retain what they've had. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people who know they're never going to fit in their high school clothes again, but they sure wouldn't mind looking a little less schlubby. What's yeah. that person going to be? Well, that's really different than a CrossFit person. CrossFit person is I'm the type of person who pushes myself to compete against myself every day. And right. I want to be better the next day than I was the day before. Right. That's like a warrior and that's fine. And that's a great market if that's who you want to sell to. Right. Um, if you want the kind of person who just wants to keep looking all right in their clothes, it's a different set or a fast, you know, soul cycle blew everyone away. The, the fact that exercise bikes are, you know, America's number one thing to put their laundry on. And now there's things like soul cycle and then these yeah. Pelotons and all that where you could buy like a $6,000 bike yeah. in your home. So here's the trend part of this, by the way, right, in, right. in your home. So you can bike with a bunch of other people somewhere else through a video camera. Yeah. That part. The trend is every, we want it all in our damn house. Right. You know, look at where we're learning this, Susan. We're not in a theater. We don't have a whole bunch of people sitting in the front row. It's because we want our information where we are. We don't want to have to go to it if we don't have to. Do you, do you remember, um, it was a long time ago, um, her, her name was Faith Popcorn. She was a futurist. She wrote a book, and I actually ran it. I gave the commencement address at my high school one year. for oh, wow. Yeah. And so I, I found the speech that I'd printed out, you know, and I, I was quoting Faith Popcorn and I was talking about what the future is going to be like. And, and we're going to be cocooning was what she called it. We're going to stay in our homes. Our social interactions are going to be from, you know, our, our computers. We're going to get everything delivered. I mean, she went to the extreme saying the crime was going to be so bad you didn't want to go outside your home. But I mean, I see that now. That's exactly what we're all doing. I work from home. I get stuff delivered. I don't even want to go to the mall and shop anymore. Forget about it. You know, my kids the other day said, can we go to the mall? And I said, the mall? <laughs> and it had been that long. I usually drag them to the mall because I'm yes. of the age. Like that's where I socialized in high school. Yeah. But I would say that, you know, my kids they get loot crates sent to the house. They get all yeah. the random things that they want. So even the idea of discovery, right? Like you might think, well, what if I don't know what I want? Right. There's companies that discover for you now. So right. yeah, I think Faith was absolutely correct. The, uh, the guy who said uh, bowling alone or something, how we're, you know, society's really just locking down. The fact that, you know, you watch any group of teenagers and they're stuck to their phones. However, you go to a nursing home and all they're stuck to their uh, tablets. Right, exactly. Because that actually changed in a very positive way. If you've got someone right. who's in assisted living of some kind, they now have a window open 
that they didn't have before. I'm, I'm right. friends with this lovely lady named Kyra Lumen, who is a motivational speaker and a, a life coach kind of person in her uh, prime. And now she's 84 or so. And she puts out a newsletter every single day. Oh my gosh. She's super prolific, writes her face off. And I have partial credit because she said to me, I'm going to be transitioning into this assisted living home. And I figure it's kind of like all over for me. So what are you talking about? You got like 30 more years. She's yeah. Like, oh, okay then. And off she went. I didn't hardly say anything. I yeah, said two I sentences, but it, I guess yeah. it clicked in her head that maybe she had some time. And I think that again, with the whole idea of demographics, you asked who should we listen yeah. to? We should go after like sort of solving questions like that. And yeah. I think the people who get in the worst trouble with business are the people who've stopped asking questions. Again, it's, it's the you sense that ask. security is the story and yeah. it's not, it's capabilities. Yeah, that's the first step of my process is to really ask those tough questions. The questions you don't know the answers to, you may not want to know the answers to, um, but you've got to you've got to experience them. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I also you mentioned you know Steve blew up, uh, Steve Jobs blew up things in Apple. Um, I refer to it as cutting the dead weight. Yes. I mean, you got to get yeah. But you know, so many companies they get married to their product or service. I, uh, in my book, I talk about Firestone. Firestone tires used to be like the top of the line. If you had Firestone tires and they did not see the Japanese radial tires, tires on the horizon. And by the time they came over here and started competing, you know, Firestone was like, okay, yeah, yeah, we, we should do those radial tires, but they didn't re-equip their factories the correct way, their inventory stacked up. And you know, it, they just could not survive. So how do you get out of that mindset? You know, letting go of a product that you know is going to die. There's a really great little video I saw on Instagram by a Brazilian jiu-jitsu trainer who goes by the name Master Chim. His real name is Justin. He said, you know what? Next time I run a big competition, I'm not going to buy any trophies for anybody. <laughs> he goes, I'm going to write it in pen on their palm. You know? Yeah. Jennifer got first place in her weight category. Congratulations, Jennifer. He said, because... By the time that wears off in your palm, that's when you stop celebrating. Call it a day. Oh, okay. I don't know if it's my Irish nature. I don't know if it's because of clinical depression or if it's just how I was forever raised. I am forever thinking, I, I, I'm washed up, I'm over, I'm going to die. I better go figure out something new. Yeah. All the time, every day. And, and, and I think the benefit to that, the, the negatives are boy, oh boy, you know, uh, anxiety. But the positive is, if you forever think that someone's, you know, going to knock you out of the running and you're not going to have yeah. your business, you forever work on, well, what's my buyer need? I think right. that's where we get messed up. We get so confused, no matter what our company is. There's a, there's a florist not too far from where I live that I think he thinks he's in business to sell uh, flowers and he's not. He's in business yeah. to commemorate events and all those sorts of right. things we say. It's emotions, right. And, and he thinks the arrangement is the deal. No. But it's not. And, and ultimately, where it gets depressing is that all the floors buy all the same dumb things. You know, you can buy a red rose anywhere, but find right. me something exotic and weird. If you're the person who says, I found a tarantula plant and it looks <laughs> like this, that's going to be interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, edible arrangements came about because someone got sick of flowers. Again, you grew up in a funeral home. You know it. Right, right. Um, you know, there's a lot of foliage between you and death, evidently. You know, right, right about the time you start getting sick until you're in a box. And even for years after, there's flowers in your life. But I think that, you know, to stay away, I mean, even the business of death, it's changed. Yeah, it it's has. changed. You That's would say the only two things that haven't changed are death and taxes. Those change every year. Yeah, exactly. So you I would say that there's so much to look at there and what do the people need? What's different? Look at sympathy cards. You know, there's a lot of people who had crappy right. relationships with their family that get these gushy cards. Right. Don't cover it. No. You know, it's funny that you mentioned the funeral home. So when my mother passed away 16 years ago, we'd already sold the business, but my father was insistent that she had the best casket, the best fault, the best of everything. Right. Right. He's 92. He wants mm -hmm. to be cremated. And I don't want any service or anything. I'm like, Daddy, it's a good thing people didn't feel that way when you had the business, right? That's right. So, but I'll tell you who's masterful at this um, is Build-A-Bear Workshop. Maxine oh, Clark. Maxine I mean, Clark's lovely. She, you know, here she's selling teddy bears. And I've collected teddy bears, Chris, my whole life. And basically, you go out and buy them off a shelf or you order them off the internet. You can spend 10 bucks at Target or 
hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get a Steve Bear in Germany, right? So, but what Maxine Clark realized is wasn't just about the teddy bear. It was about the experience. It's about the memories. And there was a commercial, I think it was either last Christmas or the year before. And it was the little, the little girl was in the store with her daddy. And she looks up at him and she said, daddy, you know what I like best about coming here with you? And he said, well, because you get to pick out your reindeer, blah, blah, blah. No, because you get to get the little clothes. And she said, no. And then she looks up to him and said, it's because I get to be with you, daddy. Hmm. I mean, I still get goosebumps when I talk. Sure. I mean, that's what she was selling is that it's what you, where you take your kids and your, those special memories. Definitely. Right. Absolutely. So Chris, I know you have a lot of resources um, available for business owners and business leaders. Tell us a little bit about what you can do so people can stay in touch with you. Well, it's a little germane to what we've talked about because the company that I run right now, Owner Media Group, the whole concept is there's all this need for new skills and actionable information. And there's a, there's a couple different things out there in the world. And a lot of times we get invited to a free webinar and it's the worst thing we've ever done because we're going to get pitched the whole time. There's no content. I mean, this is obviously all content, right? I mean, right, right, someone exactly. shows up here, but the trepidation before we click and give someone our marketing data, we're thinking we're going to die. So <laughs> In my business, what we do is uh, it's basically skills and uh, actionable information for your modern business. And the idea is that I can help you with business strategy and business skills by looking ahead and then saying, here's what we're going to work on right now. So right. we do webinars and or courses digitally that you can play on demand, play them whenever you want. We have, we have a couple different ways that you can uh, access those. And one of the ways is you can just buy just webinars and you can mm -hmm. buy a sort of a Netflix for webinars. And so... You could buy 50 plus of the webinars I've made, plus however many more I make going forward to a month. And they all have some very specific and tangible end goal. Like I start with, yeah. what, what are you going to do differently by the time I'm done? Because otherwise, I don't want to eat up your time. And so right. owner.media is the site. Um, and I always say the same thing. And you were kind enough to say you like my, my newsletter. I always say, if you get my newsletter, you know right away whether or not you want to do anything with it. You know, mm -hmm. oh, this guy's weird. Or, oh, this guy talks about like, fluffy stuff that has nothing to do with hard dollars. There's a lot of people I hope not to attract and I do everything in my writing powers to not get those people. So what you're left with is people who believe that humans matter and that the best way to you, you know, do all this is to use technology to drive a better human interaction. That's who I work for. Yeah, that's great. And actually, I mean, I'm, I do love the newsletter. Um, I also, oh, I've signed up. I'm going to take your online course maker. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. But I know what you do deliver is you want to give people the tools that they can do to build something on their own when they're finished. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's so critical. Um, and you know what, Chris, right now, I don't know if anybody in the audience has some questions, but there were a couple of questions that we had come in earlier. Oh, sure. So let me, um, Brad, can you help me out there? I can't seem to find those questions. Oh, there yes. they are. Okay, here, I got it. So Matthew May, um, this isn't quite on target, what we were talking about. That's okay. He wants to know how to attract new talent when you're just a small firm of like three people. It's more important, the smaller your firm, what kind of talent you attract, than if you're a really big firm. If you're a big firm, you can make a hiring mistake and figure it out later. Yeah. Uh, if you're a really small company, I mean, if you think you're only three and you suddenly make a fourth person, you have 25% of a bad idea there. Right. Um, I was thinking about this just yesterday. I was just thinking, boy, the interview process is really weird. We both put on clothes we don't normally wear. <laughs> we both ask questions we would never ask in the, in the normal flow of business. Right. And we, we both lie to each other as best as we can to try to get to some spot where we're going to actually work to, with each other going forward. What do you think they want? What am I going to have to say to get them to say yes to me? It's the strangest process to me. So, Matthew, I would say to, to attract the right kind of talent, this, this sounds like one of those, if you're a carpenter and you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. uh, blog, write posts, make videos, and say, this is what we do. This is what we're into. We go out and we uh, punch rabbits in the mouth every Tuesday because we hate <laughs> rabbits. Yeah. You know what? Because I'll tell you what, someone's going to be like, I hate rabbits too. I'm going to go work with Matthew May. Right? That's right. I, I think, you know, you've got to really, who I, who, put your flag out there. This is who I am. This is who I believe. You know, the negative of this that we're seeing around us, not to get especially political, 
But mm-hmm. boy, racism sure showed up. No, um, no kidding. But one of the things I love about that, which is so weird, you know what I love about racism? I love that these people who were quiet about it now are shining their light saying, I'm racist. So I can go, that's cool because I don't like racists. I think yeah. I won't work with you. So this is the same in hiring talent. Put your bat signal out there. That's why the book, The Freak Shall Inherit the Earth, has all those bats on the cover. Yeah. Because I'm trying to attract weirdos. Worked. Yeah. Um, I got, I got I weirdos. Read. There you go, Susan. So I think it's, it's that that you're looking to do. And that's the most important thing for attracting talent is let them see yeah. what it's like. And for God's sake, don't make those horrible, well-produced videos with that crappy 1980s music in it. Right, right. Make it real. Yeah. And, and honestly, I call that the employment mm-hmm. brand. I mean, uh, we all yes. have a employment brand, right? I mean, and you want to be the place that we want to attract people who are going to share your vision, who are going to share your values. Skills can be taught, but you can't change the person. So no question. All right. Let's see. We've got another question here. Um, it's from Kimberly Holster. She says, how do you reach customers when your product is very new to an area? So let's pretend it is um, very organic coconut based products like coconut oil, coconut skin cream, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Skinny okay. and company reached out to me and said, Hey, Chris, you seem like the kind of guy who uses beauty products. Here's some beauty products. And I got them and I made a video cause I had so much fun. I'm like, yeah. I don't know what you do with this. And I'm like rubbing it on my face. You could hear my beard, like scratch, scratch, scratch <laughs> in this stuff. It was unbelievable. And by the way, great products. I was like, wow. Really? Yeah. I still use their uh, shampoo. Oh, um, nice. They have like a raw and it's, and by the way, so their buyer, whether, I don't know what they think their buyer is. Their buyer are people who have an insane amount of allergies and really can't have all those crazy things in their oh, stuff right, yeah. and really want really natural stuff. Cause these things have like five ingredients wow. and you know, they want like this to be like very, um, what's the word I want? Uh, ethically sourced and all this kind of stuff. That's who buys a $20 bar of soap that uses shampoo. Right. Right. That is not your typical Walmart buyer, et cetera. So how do you find that person? You find the people who are writing about that stuff, talking about that stuff. You find the people who are interested in that and you say, boy, have I got something for you. And you make sample kits and you, you yeah. do all that old fashioned stuff. But the web all day long, Twitter, Facebook, all these places have people explaining and exclaiming what they want. Right. And all you got to do is go out there and search. Search.twitter.com, Facebook search bar, natural, yeah. ethically sourced, you know, Google. And you start finding it and you start gathering these people to say, hey, this is interesting. And if you get really clever at it, you make media that's interesting. You make videos. Right. This skinny and company, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Their videos are boring as hell. And it looks like it was made by some video company. Um, wow. I would love for them to fly back to all those places and just shoot it with a hand camera and just yeah, make yeah. it feel like you and I would have shot it. Um, and I think that there are those people, uh, Whole Foods should buy this product, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so Amazon owns Whole Foods. Amazon right. wants this kind of distribution. I think there's a lot of opportunity. So no matter what your company is, find the person who should be buying it and get yourself in front of them because it starts right. to expand out. It, it, don't yeah. worry that you don't People know talking. everybody. Yeah, else. exactly. And it's so much easier to do today with social media. You know, it's word exactly. of mouth on, you know, cyber on steroids, right? So, well, is anybody else in the audience have an, uh, a question for us? Let me check the chat box here. Um, all right. Well, Chris, I think this is great fun. I have a blast. Yeah, I hope you'll do it with me again. Oh, wait a minute. There's one more. Oh. Okay, this is from Donna. Oh, she said, we have a printing company since 1985. We've successfully been able to attract business by word of mouth, what we're just saying. As the times are changing, we desperately need to attract a sales rep who would come with a book of business. Any suggestions on how we can locate that sales rep without going through a headhunter? That's a great question. Ha. Huh. If you had a time machine, the answer would be very easy. Um, sales reps are a very different human than they used to be. And that environment takes a lot of finesse and nuance because, uh, I mean, there's so many needs for printed product. There's, it, it's, there, there's so many of these, you know, high fluting internet people that are like, Oh, I don't even have business yeah. cards anymore. And they're the kind of people who actually also don't have business. Right. So, um, I think that there's, there's definitely a lot of, use for a printing company and whatnot, but to, to find a salesperson who has a quote book, I would least want to want that person. I would want the kind of people who know how to start a conversation, who know how to, to conceptualize serving suggestions. 
You know, in, in, in World War II, we were sending our best cuts of meat over to the soldiers and uh, the housewives at the time, because that's the demographics at the time, were standing around in grocery stores looking at things like cow tongue, going, I don't know what to do with this. It's gross looking when you look at it. Yeah. So uh, stores invented the advertising and marketing around serving suggestions. This is uh, how you uh, use it. Yeah, right. That's where it came from. Um, and uh, that's how you could take ugly looking TV dinners and make them look beautiful on the box because you could write this as a serving suggestion. Well, so it's a go. lie too. It's a truth right, and a lie. Right. I would say that the, the, what a printing company needs now is to start looking in creatively about who needs this. What kinds of new businesses don't think they need it? I was just thinking about, for instance, there's this whole new business world around cannabis. I've never smoked pot in my life, but now it's a thing and it's a business. And in, in right. lots of states in the United States, at least, there's a lot going on there. Well, how do they get their attraction? How do they get their word of mouth? How do they get, you know, a printing company might help with packaging ideas, might right. have some ideas of what goes in the bag besides the product, you know? Right. It's uh, not necessarily just printing up a flyer, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so right. there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities to go after new business that someone with a book of business doesn't have. Because the, the only thing that I'm, negative about that book of business person is they're all going to shake all the old trees that they've already shaken. You know what I mean? They yeah. have a Rolodex from, you know, the 1990s that they're still hoping that the insurance company in town is going to be their big, you know, person right. that they're going to take out to dinner. And I think and everybody's that chasing the after idea. the same thing too. You know, everybody's yeah. going after the same business. Exactly. Good point. Well, Chris, thank you again. Thanks to everybody else for being here. Your questions were absolutely great. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. And of course, Chris Brogan, you're just the best. I just love you. You're just oh, thank great. You. So I hope you guys will all sign up for his newsletter, check out his resources, check out his books. And of course, I hope that you'll be checking out my book, which is coming out in February. You can actually buy it now online at Amazon pre-sales. Um, I would certainly appreciate it if you do. My goal is to help you build innovation into your company's leadership. And my webcast and my podcast too, which is a weekly program, is all about bringing you the best of the best so you can become the best in your business. So until next month, when we're going to be having another great 1% Edge webcast, I hope to see you then. Thanks, Chris. Thanks again to Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, American Management Association, and Amacom.